Heavenly Father, I thank you for the chance to open your word uh, this morning with your people. And God, I pray that your word would be powerful. Um, as it says in 2 Timothy, it's uh, powerful, sharp as a double-edged sword. It teaches, it corrects, it rebukes, it trains in righteousness. And God, I pray that uh, what I have to say would not in any way interfere uh, with the truth that you have for your people from your word this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're in the midst of a series here at Christ Church on prayers from the Bible. And I think several weeks ago, looked at Luke 18, in which a tax collector calls out to God uh, for forgiveness. And as you might have noticed as our psalm was uh, read, this is a penitential psalm, which is a fancy word to say that it's a psalm of penitence or a psalm of forgiveness. And there are six uh, like it in the Bible. But here in Psalm 130, the speaker is not a tax collector. He is a faithful Jew who would have made trips to the temple, offered sacrifices, grown up hearing God's law, probably had much of it memorized. And so he isn't discovering God's grace for the first time. This is not a conversion experience as um, Matthew 18, Luke 18 probably was rather. And so it reminds us that since this is someone who has experienced God's grace, that prayers of forgiveness or penitence are something um, that occur in the life or should occur in the life of a believer on a regular basis. And there's one other thing to note about this psalm before we get into verse 1, and that is that this is right in the middle of what are known as the Psalms of Ascent. The psalms of Ascent begin in Psalm 120, and the last Psalm of Ascent is Psalm 134. And what that means, uh, there are probably a few different ways that those were used, but um, Psalms of Ascent, it, it, whenever you go to Jerusalem, you might have noticed that the Bible uh, always says they went up to Jerusalem. You know, we might say I went up to Westchester because that's north, um, but that's not the way they were thinking. When they say, you know, up to Jerusalem, they're thinking geographically raised. So you actually, from any, any place in Israel, you're climbing if you're going to Jerusalem. And so you're going up. And so this is a psalm of ascent, which means that they are ascending towards Jerusalem. And these are the psalms that would have been quoted, prayed together, for sure would have been memorized as they go up to Jerusalem uh, for festival days. Uh, there's another interesting detail. The steps of the temple before it was destroyed you know, by the Romans had 15 steps. And there are 15 psalms here. So we think that each one of these psalms was prayed as they ascended the temple. So you can imagine the people going to Jerusalem. The crowds must have been enormous as uh, the faithful gathered for a yearly sacrifice. And then everything slows down as they approach that temple. Not to rush it to take in the full experience of ascending the Temple Mount with God's people. And you can imagine so many people pausing on each step. And so I did the math. This would have been the 11th step. Uh, Psalm 130 would have been said on the 11th step. And I suspect that the 11th step is very familiar with the words that uh, you just heard here. But there again, it reminds us that forgiveness is not uh, a one-time thing. In other words, what I mean by that is that uh, just like we see Jesus washing the disciples' feet, and Jesus says to Peter, I must wash your feet or you have no part with me. And he says, well, then wash my whole body. And he says, you've already had a bath, but you do need your feet washed. And so we're reminded that this is uh, part of the uh, life of a believer. And this morning, I want to draw attention to three phrases in this psalm that are unique to this psalm. I think unique in some sense to prayers for forgiveness in the Bible. We're not going to parse out every verse. I have a long discussion about every verse here, but simply look at three things that are unique and that I hope can infuse our own uh, prayers for forgiveness um, with a biblical understanding. They're unique not just to this passage, but I believe they're unique to a Christian understanding of what it means to seek forgiveness from God. And the first, number one, if you're a note taker, is the condition of man. The first is the condition of man. And we see that right here in the first verse where the psalmist says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. What an arresting way to begin a psalm. He says, Out of the depths I cry to you. Now, 
I debated whether or not to use this illustration, and I, th I think I will because it's, it does the job. Uh, but I thought, where, did I, where do I remember hearing this phrase? I, obviously from reading it, but I knew I had seen it in a movie at some point. And uh, there's a movie called The Sixth Sense that came out, I think, in the late 90s. And um, The Sixth Sense, it sounds like an ominous title, but it really isn't. But it's about um, a person who is able to see ghosts. He's very frightened by this. And the psychologist working with this boy is trying to figure out what is going, why, did, why is this kid lying? Why is he acting? Is he looking for attention? What's going on at home? Then he remembers 20 or so years ago, someone who had very similar symptoms. And so he gets out a tape, of, tape recording of their discussion. And at one point he had to leave the room, but he kept the recorder going in this meeting 20 years ago with this young man. And he listened very carefully and, and the young man heard uh, speaking in Spanish and it was the Spanish phrase from Psalm 130 verse one. He was saying in Spanish over and over, out of the depths I cry to you, God, out of the depths I cry to you. And what you realize is that he was crying out because he was seeing ghosts and he was terrified. Now there are two things about, there's one thing I like about that illustration, one thing I don't like. What I like about it is it captures the depth of desperation that the psalmist here is feeling. Because in our comfortable life here in 2019, it's easy to dive right into this psalm and keep moving without catching the gravity of this opening phrase. And so if we can liken that to the desperation of being terrified about something that I think the movie conveyed well, you know, in this case, then we're starting to get a sense for how desperate the psalmist here is. But the thing that I don't like is that uh, in the movie, the man saying this, he's just a victim. He didn't do anything wrong. But that isn't the case here in our psalm. The distinctly Christian nature of this opening is that the psalmist is not just in the depths because he's a victim. He's in the depths because he has put himself there. He recognizes that his desperation is due to his own choices and his own decisions and his own actions. And so it isn't just someone who's having a bad week or even a bad life, but someone who has brought that bad upon himself. And you might have recognized in that opening phrase, out of the depths I cried to you, O Lord, something else similar from the Old Testament, and that is the book of Jonah. Jonah cries out from the depths. I mean, he cries out from the depths of the Mediterranean Sea, but he cries out from the further depths of inside of a whale. Now, whether or not you believe in a literal understanding of that, I do, but the, the rhetorical force of that is depth upon depths, right? Inside the, the, the whale, in the Mediterranean Sea, he's totally helpless, and of course, there again, why is he there? He's not a victim. He's made choices that have landed him there, just like the psalmist recognizes. And so the first element that makes this psalm unique, in other words, it uh, helps us to gain a, a Christian understanding of what it means to repent, is the recognition that it's self-implicating. It starts with, I've done this, I, I'm in the depths, whatever the symptoms of that may be, I'm not a victim simply, I am someone who's brought this upon myself. I have a goal of reading a short commentary in every book of the Bible. This is a life goal, by the way, not a summer goal. It's going to take a long time. I'm in the book of Job right now. And if you've ever read the book of Job, you know that uh, he has some terrible things happen. His servants are killed. His children are killed. Um, he gets sick, and his wife isn't very helpful. And finally, the friends that come to help, in essence, they look at his circumstances, and they say, fess up, Job. This doesn't happen to people that haven't done anything wrong. Just come out with it. In other words, their understanding of his trial is this level of you know, trial does not happen to somebody who is totally innocent. But our culture is not likely to make that mistake. In other words, when bad things happen, it's unlikely that in general, in our culture, in our society today, people will say, well, obviously you're sinning against the Lord. I mean, I don't know of any, even Christians, who will say that. Our problem is more likely the opposite in our culture today. In other words, to say, not you're suffering, what did you do wrong, but you're suffering, what did somebody do wrong to you?
Things are going badly because you're a victim. When we look at scripture, we actually see something more complicated, I think, than either of those two things. In other words, we don't see uh, you, you've done all kinds of wrong and that's why you're suffering, nor do we see you're suffering because you're a victim of circumstances. And I think nobody puts it better from a modern standpoint than C.S. Lewis. He writes this, and see if you can relate to this experience. He, he's talking, I had to dig this quote up. I remember reading it like 15 years ago and I was able to find it again in an obscure essay that he wrote. Uh, but he's describing here his own prayer for forgiveness. He writes, often when I ask God's forgiveness, I find that when I think I am asking God to forgive me, I am often in reality, unless I watch myself very carefully, asking him to do something quite different. I am asking him not to forgive me, but to excuse me. But there is all the difference in the world between forgiving and excusing. Forgiveness says, yes, you have done this thing, but I accept your apology. I will never hold it against you, and everything between us will be exactly as it was before. If one was not really to blame, then there was nothing to forgive. In that sense, forgiveness and excusing are almost opposites. Of course, in dozens of cases, either between God and man or between one man and another, there may be a mixture of the two. The trouble is that what we call asking God's forgiveness very often really consists of asking God to accept our excuses. What leads us into this mistake is the fact that there usually is, uh, there usually is some amount of excuse some extenuating circumstances. We are so very anxious to point these out to God and to ourselves that we are apt to forget the very important thing that is the bit left over, the bit which excuses, excuses don't cover, the bit which is inexcusable but not, thank God, unforgivable. And if we forget this, we should go on imagining that we have repented and been forgiven when all that has really happened is that we have satisfied ourselves with our own excuses. They may be very bad excuses. We are all too easily satisfied with ourselves. He goes on to say that when we observe the sin in someone else, we're likely to magnify their culpability, right? Magnify their choice in it. But when we sin, we're more prone to magnify the excuses. So I have an excuse for my bad decisions, but I'm not very likely to see the excuses someone else might have for theirs. But the point is that a Christian understanding of seeking forgiveness starts with self-implication and crying out from the depths, from a place of recognition of, I'm here not just as a victim, but I'm here because of my own choices. And so the psalmist starts with a sinful condition of man. The second element we notice here is God's compelling grace. Number two is God's compelling grace. To my knowledge, <clears throat> this idea, and it's in verse 4, I, I don't see it put this way anywhere else in the whole Bible that I've seen. And it's this very interesting phrase that maybe you caught and wondered about, at least briefly, or maybe you've wondered before if you've read this psalm. In verse 4 he says, with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. With you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Let's work up to it. He says in verse 3, if you should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? And I like the NIV here as well. He says, if you kept a record of sins, who could stand? In other words, there's that sense that if you had t kept a tally mark of everything I've done every day of my life since I started this thing of sinning, who could stand before you? And obviously the conclusion is somewhat predictable here. He says, <clears throat> with you there is forgiveness. And that's the good news. And I think we understand all of this. You know, the psalmist is experiencing what one of my friends calls the Niagara of God's grace pouring over him. His sin, the forgiveness is so astounding because his recognition of how, uh, how much he has sinned is so astounding. To the extent that he sees his sinfulness, the Niagara of God's grace is all the more powerful in his life. But it's the last part of verse 4 that is interesting. Because he says, with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Now think about that. That's counterintuitive, is it not? I mean, how often do we say, you know, that person is so forgiving that I feel a fear of them. It's more likely we feel the opposite. I'm afraid to go into work late because my boss isn't very forgiving. 
right? It's lack of forgiveness that usually causes us fear. It's puzzling, isn't it? And so uh, I, I found it puzzling too until I thought about it this way. You know, it's possible to fear someone and not have any respect or admiration for them at all. Maybe you had a teacher in school that you had some fear of, but that didn't mean that you admired them, didn't mean that you necessarily respected them. You may have. You might fear, uh, as you know, a child may fear an angry parent, some capricious sort of uh, parent, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have a respect for that person. In other words, fear and respect are not the same thing. And that's why you may have heard that fear when used of God means something different than I am afraid of God. In fact, wrapped up in this idea is the concept of respect. He says, you are an abundantly forgiving God. In verse 7, he uses this phrase, with him there is plentiful redemption. But it's interesting that he doesn't say, you are forgiving and yet you are feared. He says, you are forgiving and therefore you are feared. And here's what I think is going on here. Think about the people in your life. Maybe you've had a situation where you messed up bad. Maybe you uh, mumbled some things about somebody in secret that got back to them and you wronged them badly. You maligned them, you gossiped about them, and they come back to you and they forgive you for that. There is a, there's a sense in which that forgiveness forces you to take them more seriously. What they're doing is they're taking a step towards you in relationship. They're um, establishing a level of, of gravitas about themselves. I mean, you're forced to look at them not as a child who gets angry, but as an adult who has taken one on the chin, who has absorbed your debt for you, who has done something to put you in their good graces. And if you can if you've ever had that experience, I think you have a shadow of what the psalmist is experiencing here about God. He says, my sin is, in one place he says, my sin is more than the hairs on, on my head and my heart fails within me. And his knowledge that God has forgiven him, even of that, uh, establishes for him a level of love, respect, not just that he's afraid of God, but we need to understand fear here as this God I am taking seriously. This is fear inside of a relationship, not outside of one. In other words, this is a biblical fear. And God's grace, when understood rightly, doesn't give license to sin. It actually causes us to desire to be better people. And um, I don't know if you've had that experience like I have, but when that person forgives you of something, does it not make you a better person? I know that when I'm in the presence of somebody who has been abundantly forgiving, they've been gracious to me. My response generally isn't, oh good, I can get away with a lot more. It causes me to desire to be a better man. It raises me. And that's what the psalmist is experiencing as well. Number three, the final um, uh, point here that stands out that I think is unique to this psalm and unique to a Christian experience of forgiveness, we'll call the great desire. The great desire. And again, I mentioned that there were three unusual phrases here in Psalm 130, and the last phrase is repeated twice. And it's the phrase, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. Now, uh, you know, with our modern word processors, it's easy to copy and paste anything we want. But you have to imagine thousands of years of transmission that this phrase was copied over and over painstakingly by scribes twice. And, you know, we're all about efficiency, right? Okay, I got it. You already said it. But the Old Testament, and often the New Testament, repeat things because they're trying to... It's, it's almost like the modern equivalent of putting something in bold or highlighting it. How else do you do that, right? People are listening. They're not looking at the text. They're listening to the text. And so how do you get people to stop and make sure they don't miss something important? You say it twice. And he says it twice identically. He says, my soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. Lest we miss how much he is waiting for God's forgiveness and how much he is longing for it, he repeats it twice. But I want to 
pause here on his image of watchmen. <clears throat> it reminds me of uh, at Geneva School, the eighth grade studies Hamlet, and it opens with watchmen up on the top of the castle, and they are waiting for morning as well. It's dark and the sun is coming up. I used to work as a security guard when I was in college uh, for about one year, and the new guys get the bad shifts, and I got the 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. shift. Waking up at 4 a.m. is particularly difficult. You know, you can stay up till 1 a.m. and not go to sleep and go do your job, but you have to go to sleep before 4 a.m., obviously. But there's something very difficult about it. I used to get up at about 3.45. In fact, I sometimes would even sleep in my yeah, uniform so that I could get up you know, five minutes later. That's how much I wanted sleep. And I can tell you, when you're alone as a security guard or as a watchman, and I would sit in that guard shack, and no cars would come through, and nothing would happen, there was one thing on my mind. When is the sun going to come up? How much longer? You know, we, I don't know, this image doesn't stick as well in our day as it did when the psalmist wrote it, but if we get that sense, we're, we're seeing what he, his heart's longing is for God's forgiveness, to be right with God. He has a recognition of his sin, and he says, I hate it now. I want God's forgiveness. I want the sun to rise in my life. I want it to shine into the corners of my life. I have nothing to hide because before a faithful God, I've been forgiven. I'm waiting on you. It's just, just like that watchman is wrapped up in that one thought, when is the sun going to rise? He's wrapped up in, I'm longing for you. Your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your wisdom, all those things that we admire, they're sources in God. And he says, I want that in my life. I'll close with this thought because it illustrates the great desire. Uh, this year, my family and I vacationed, as we always do, in the Adirondack Mountains. I've been going there since I was two years old. And uh, <clears throat> that's almost 40 years, you know, of going up to the Adirondacks. And I still look forward to it every year. We go to the same lake every year. And on my way up, we were driving by the Hudson River, which, you know, you see the Hudson often. But up there in the Adirondacks, it's a different river. It's more like, you know, it's, it's a little bit rockier and there are rapids and it looks great. And I saw some people floating down the river in tubes. And I thought, that looks fun. And so my, my mom and dad and my sister and brother-in-law all uh, are up there for the week with us. And in their grace, they went along with my idea. And I went back and pitched this idea of going out in these tubes on a river. I went and I found out where do we get in, where do we get out, all of this stuff. Well, we got into a tributary called Cedar River, and we should have known before we got in, but it looked a little bit rocky, it looked a little bit too rocky. Uh, but I thought it would, somebody had just recommended it, they said, I just did it this week and it's great. We got in these tubes, and I'm telling you, you couldn't go five feet without getting stuck on a rock. I mean, there, was er there were areas where it was 100 yards of one inch deep you know, water, so we literally had to pick up our tubes and walk in bare feet over slippery rocks. It was awful. And we, uh, we were gonna go about three miles. After two hours, we had gone one mile. And I look back at my mom and dad, slipping on, carrying their tubes over rocks with a good attitude, thinking, boy, they really love me right now. They're not even complaining. But I looked back there and I thought, this has to end. Like, I have to act now. Because it will be, it, I did the calculations, it would have been about 9 p.m. before we had arrived back at our car, which would have been an entire day of pulling ourselves across rocks and lifting our walking, and it was awful. So I saw a place where I could get out of the river. There was no good place to do it. It was steep, and the hand of man had never touched this river bank. It was totally unkempt. I mean, the weeds had grown from prehistoric times to the height of about 10 feet. But I got out in my flip-flops and fought my way through. Things were wrapping around my waist. It didn't want, the woods didn't want to let me free. I had swimming trunks on and flip-flops. But I thought of my parents back there, my sister and brother-in-law, my kids were also there, and fought my way through, emerged looking like the swamp thing, probably, with all kinds of stuff all over me, and realized I had arrived at the clubhouse of the golf course that I golf at. By the grace of God, it was civilization. And so I walked up to the clubhouse, and there was this sweet old couple getting into their car, putting their clubs in. And I said, can you guys help me out? 
And they said, what do you need? And I said, my car is parked about a mile up the road. I'm not going to get where I thought I was going on this river. My family is in the river. We have to get out. And I am too far from my car to walk in flip-flops. And uh, no cell phone with me, of course, because you don't want your cell phone in the river. And uh, he said, what do you want me to do? And he said, can you drive me to my car? It's about a mile up the road. They were so sweet. I was, cover I was soaked. I was covered in junk and weeds. And they let me into their, and it was a pretty new car. They let me sit in the back seat of their car and they drove me. I drove my car back, got my parents. Uh, it was a harrowing day, but everything turned out okay. But my point is, you know, I don't generally approach strangers and ask them for favors, especially in New York City. Uh, but in general, I would never walk up to some people I don't know and say, hey, can you do this thing for me? Why did I do it? I had no choice. What am I going to do? Walk a mile in flip-flops? You know, there's, we're in the middle of nowhere. This is where the psalmist is. Absolute desperation. He says, I need forgiveness. I can't do it alone. When you're in the depths, the image there is of a deep well. What are you going to do? You can't climb out on your own. And only when you reach that point where you say, I'm totally helpless. I need help. I am humble enough now to ask the first person that shows up, regardless of their skill, their ingenuity, their intelligence, or what kind of car they have, just help me, please. That's where the psalmist is. And my hope and prayer for me and for you is that we have that sense of our need for God's grace, that we say, God, I need your forgiveness, and I can't live without it. Like Peter says to Jesus, God, Christ, where can we go? You have the words of life. There's nowhere else to go. You know, I was thinking there is a place where Jesus calls out from the depths, and he says uh, from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think that's Jesus in his prayer. Not a prayer for forgiveness, of course, but a prayer of calling out from the depths. And I thought about what is the answer to that question? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, if we say that, the answer is because you've sinned. Light has no fellowship with darkness because the character and nature of God require him to forsake sin. But when Jesus says, my God, why have you forsaken me? The answer is just the opposite, because you haven't sinned. This was the plan, that you would live a perfect life and ultimately be rejected, not because you sinned, but because you didn't sin, and you're the perfect sacrifice. And, of course, Jesus submits himself to the will of the Father. And so we end our psalm by reminding ourselves that we can call out from the depths and be answered, because Christ called out from the depths and he got a, a deaf ear. He went unanswered by God. There was no answer because that was the plan of salvation that would make forgiveness possible for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your truth and your word. We thank you for this desperate cry for forgiveness from Psalm 130. We don't know who the speaker is. We don't know the circumstances. And that is a good thing because it allows us to apply this in a general way to our own life experience. God, may we cry out from the depths to you. We thank you for your grace and mercy to us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.